East, they think all the, the countries in the Middle East are Muslim countries. This was not the case 30 years ago. Lebanon was the only majority Christian country in the Middle East. Lebanon was the most westernized modern country in the Middle East. When we got our independence from France in the early 40s, the majority of the population were Christian, the Muslims were the minority. We prospered, we built the country, we are the descendants of the Phoenicians, we were good in commerce, and in a very short period of time, Lebanon became Paris of the Middle East, the banking capital of the Middle East. We had the best universities in the Middle East, the best education centers, the best schools, the best theaters. We exported the theater and the art to the rest of the Arabic world. That's why a lot of Arabic countries understand the Lebanese dialect through our culture, but while we do not understand many of theirs. We had open borders. We were a very multicultural society. We allowed people to come into our country freely and study in our country. They usually graduated and stayed there because our country offered them the best economic um, uh, perspective for a job in the Middle East, even though we didn't have any oil. That was Lebanon. The situation began to change gradually as the Muslims started growing and becoming more than 50% of society. We, the Christians, do not multiply as much, while the Muslims, a lot of them, are allowed to marry up to four wives at a time. This is how they multiplied. We started shrinking, they started growing. The most famous Muslim in the world today is Osama bin Laden. Osama bin Laden is one out of 53 children. He himself has 27 children. Between father and son, they have produced 80 children. This is what tipped the scale in the Middle East over the years. And one, we always had our problem controlled with the Muslims until the influx of the Palestinians out of Jordan when King Hussein kicked them out of Jordan in Black September. And actually, King Hussein killed more Palestinians in Black September than the state of Israel has killed in all its existence. Lebanon, not surprisingly, being a country based on Judeo-Christian values with open borders and multicultural uh, attitude, took the Palestinians in. We were the only country in the Middle East who took the Palestinians in for the third wave of refugees in 1970. Once they came in, they put their heads together with the radical Islamists in our country and declared holy war on the Christians. Yasser Arafat tried to establish in Lebanon a base from which to attack Israel, something he tried to do in Jordan and failed because of the Jordanian dictatorship by the king. Yet he was able to do it in Lebanon using our laws, our multiculturalism, our tolerance, and our open-mindedness against us. The problem worsened by 1974. Christians became prisoners to their homes and towns. We stopped traveling. I would ask my parents, how come we're not going to Beirut this year for Christmas? Because the rest of my family lived in Beirut. And my father would give me an excuse, well, we decided to stay home this year. The reason why we stopped traveling is because the Muslims and the Palestinians would set up checkpoints and would stop cars driving. And they would look at the people's IDs. And in Lebanon, as in throughout the Middle East, our religion is identified on our ID. You are either a Christian, a Muslim, or a Jew. So when the Palestinians and the Muslims would stop the car and see that this family is a Christian family, they would get them out of the car and shoot them in cold blood. It was called identity killing at the time. We stopped traveling. That's why we became prisoners. By 1975, the Palestinians and the Muslims formed an army called Jaish Lebanon al-Arabi, the Arabic Lebanese army, and started taking over the military bases and destroying the Lebanese infrastructure and attacking the Lebanese government institutions. The army base above my house in South Lebanon was the last army base left in the country in the hands of the Lebanese army. This was in 1975. They grouped their people together and in trying to take over the military base in my town, they bombed my home, bringing it down and burying me under the rubble. This was in 1975. I was wounded. I ended up in a hospital for two and a half months and undergone surgeries. And I would ask my parents, why did they do this to us? And my father would tell me, because we are Christians. The Muslims consider us infidels. So I learned at a very young age, at age 10 years old, that I am wanted dead simply because I was born into the Christian faith. I left the hospital and I came home, and my home was no longer the home I left. I ended up living in a bomb shelter 
underground with no electricity, no water, and very little food. To get some water, we would crawl to a nearby spring under sniper's bullets, my mother and I, in a ditch, and we would get to the spring, and my mother had to use the stocking on top of the bottle of water to catch all the worms and all the rocks and all the maggots so we can drink the water. And then we would crawl back to the bomb shelter. Before we left, every time we would say our last goodbyes because we did not know if we're going to be if we're going to come back alive or dead. We didn't have any food. My mother finally crawled up to our uh, uh, storage place and brought down rice, dried rice, and dried lentils and dried chickpeas, and she would soak them overnight so we can eat. And this was the food we lived on. The only greenery we had to eat was the grass that grew around our bomb shelter. I would crawl out under the bombs and I would dig grass out. And I learned how to peel the thorn so I can eat the stalk with my ripe hands of 12 years old so I can eat the green stalk inside the thorn. That was the only greenery we ate. We had no heat. We would freeze. We are in the mountains. We are with, next to the border of Israel. My father had to light, uh, break twigs from trees and pour kerosene and benzene on them in the middle of our bomb shelter, our 8 by 10 room where we lived underground. And many times we would cuddle around the fire, and many times we would fall asleep, and we had an agreement. Whoever woke up first would drag the other two outside and slap them on their face to wake up because of carbon monoxide poisoning. We would pass out. This was my life. Meanwhile, we were surrounded by the Palestinians and the Muslims who want to slaughter us. And we knew what our fate was going to be because we knew what they were doing to the Christian towns in Lebanon as they overtaken the country. They, people that have fled from the rest of Lebanon who came to our area would tell us what they were doing in the other parts of Lebanon. One of the main famous massacres is the massacre of the Moor. They massacred many Christians. They would walk into a bomb shelter meaning the Islamists and the Palestinians. They would find the family hiding in a bomb shelter. They would find the mother and a father with a little baby. They would take the baby, tie one leg of the baby to the mother and another leg to the father and pull the parents apart, splitting the child in half. They would walk into our churches, urinate and defecate on the altar using the Bibles as toilet paper. The last lady that worked for me was completely mentally disturbed. I hired her so I can take care of her and her family. They tied her to a chair. They tied her 16-year-old son on her lap, held a knife to her hand, and made her behead him before they raped her two daughters in front of her. I think the biggest disservice the American media did to the American public is not show them the beheading of Daniel Pearl and Nick Berg. I think we in America, as a civilization, need to understand the barbaric nature of the enemy we are facing that's heading our way. Few people from my town, knowing what our fate was going to be, went to Israel, who was supposedly the enemy at the time. Israel was supposedly Lebanon's enemy, according to the government-controlled media. But we as Christians, our back was to the Jews, Israel. Our front was to the Palestinians and the Muslims. And we knew of the two evils, of the two devils, the Jews are not going to slaughter us because we had more shared values with them than we had with the radical Islamists and the Palestinians. Few people from my town went to Israel and begged for help. And Israel started coming in in the middle of the night from 1976 till 1978, bringing food for the children, blinking, bringing bomb shelters to the people who didn't have a bomb shelter, bringing blankets to the family, bringing medication, bringing food for the military, bringing ammunition to the Christians, and teaching them how to fight, taking them into Israel to be trained. Because the Christian Lebanese had college degrees, had education. They were not street gangs. And you can have all the college degrees on your wall behind you, your doctorates, your law degree, and everything else. It doesn't do you squat when you are faced with an enemy who believes that beheading you is an order from Allah. And this is how we stayed alive for another two years. Until 1978, one day one of our militia members, the Christian militia in the south, came to us and he said, I just want to let you know that tonight we're going to be attacked. And we may die because we had lost so many people and I don't think we can fight. And I just want to wish you a merciful death. And I remember dressing in my burial clothes at age 13 because I did not want to look ugly when I'm dead because I wanted to look pretty. And I remember putting on my Easter dress that my mother had made for me. And we had a two-hour ceasefire. 
And my mother was combing my long hair and tying a white ribbon in it that matched the white flowers in my dress. One of the top enforcers of this politically correct and driven fear is CARE, the Council on American Islamic Relations. For years, CARE had bullied, berated, intimidated, and smeared anyone who dared criticize radical Islam. For years, CARE has been the go-to organization for the media and our government. This in spite of its documented ties to Hamas and its long list of leaders and officials who have either been investigated, arrested, or convicted on terrorism-related charges. After Hassan's terror attack, CARE trotted out Executive Director Nihad Awad, who insisted that no religious faith could justify this attack. He insisted there was nothing in Islam that could justify this attack. He insisted this had nothing to do with Islam. Awad 